Good morning, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Breakfast with the Investigators. As this morning, we talk about the management of ovarian cancer and new clinical research findings in the field. We have a great faculty this morning, Dr. Philip Harder for the Yvonne Clinical Eason Mitt uh, in Eason, Germany, uh, Dr. David O'Malley from the Ohio State University, and Dr. Shannon Weston from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, we're really excited to be here this weekend again at ASCO. Uh, here are the topics we're gonna talk about today. Uh, there's no presentations. We're really gonna be making rounds with the faculty, uh, picking their brains. And in anticipation of this uh, conference, we actually did a survey of 75 general medical oncologists. We've been presenting the results of that survey this weekend and included uh, in that was uh, ovarian cancer. And basically we said, what would you like us to ask the faculty? Uh, so we had, I think, almost 800 suggestions for questions. We picked out a few of them. We'll see how many of those we can get through and you might wanna check them out on the slides. We also asked people uh, how, uh, about uh, how much emphasis we sh should put on the various topics. You can see a lot of continued interest and maybe even continued confusion in some areas that maybe got more, in will increase this weekend actually uh, on the upfront maintenance therapy in ovarian cancer. A lot of interest in Mervituximab and Upri, uh, the two antibody drug conjugates, Merv now available, Upri in development. Uh, we'll be talking about that and more, but we're gonna start out talking about frontline maintenance, except as always, when I sit down with the faculty, we meet ahead of time. I always learn some things. I gotta bring up one thing that I just heard this morning from Dr. O'Malley that I had not heard before. CAR T and bispecifics in ovarian cancer. Just give us like a little bit of a taste of that, Dave. Well, I think we're just on, on the start of, of the opportunities here. And there continues to be such great opportunities within, um, great opportunities, great challenges, and we need better therapies in the platinum-resistant space. So Surpass was presented at uh, ESMO, ESMO, I believe, and we saw nearly a 50% response rate in platinum-resistant for CAR-T, bispecific, uh, for example, the Regeneron uh, uh, product with ubimatumab, um, we're showing in the mid-20s with good duration and response and sustain. I have actually a patient who's been on for a couple of years. So really exciting that we've been disappointed in, in checkpoint inhibitors, but now we're seeing the next generation. And hopefully today we'll talk a little bit about the opportunities here. So yeah, and, and you've actually used by anti-CD3 by specifics. Of course, we're gonna talk about that, to that tonight. We have one approved in myeloma. Uh, to clistamab, uh, so uh, interesting that maybe this is gonna come in. Well, let's get back to where we are today and where we've been the last few years in terms of part maintenance, and particularly Philip's uh, very much anticipated presentation yesterday of the DUO study, and I guess uh, one thing we should say, but we, we could spend a lot of time, we were sitting there in the faculty room trying to compare it to Paula 1, et cetera, et cetera, complicated study. We're not gonna be able to go through all of it, but the bottom line is, Philip, as far as I can see, what you just presented was the first positive trial of a checkpoint inhibitor in ovarian cancer. Um, we'll go through you know, what, what you, know, you looked at and what it might mean, but I guess really the key there that you're looking at is the problematic group of HR proficient tumors. And we all know over the last few years, and maybe Shannon, you can just sort of summarize where we've been the last few years since we saw the SOLO, the Prima study, uh, more recent data on that whole story with the root cap rib, but where we sort of landed. And I guess one, one part of the equation are the BRCA patients, the HR uh, positive patients. So what's, our, what's the approach today to those patients first? Let's start there. Yeah, I mean, I think we have very, very clear data that when you have the presence of a biomarker, and in this case, a BRCA mutation or some of the other hereditary mutations that can confer benefit, a PARP inhibitor is absolutely the standard of care in frontline as a single agent. So that goes across Solo 1, which is Alaparib, Prima, 
and Prime for Naraparib, and Athena Mono for Rucaparib, although to be clear, that does not have an FDA approval, only a compendium listing. And then, of course, we, we saw the work out of Paola 1, which is combining a PARP inhibitor with bevacizumab. So if you are using bevacizumab in your practice, then you can add that PARP inhibitor. And that's very clear for patients with a, a germline mutation or a somatic mutation. It is also clear for patients that have HRD test positive or homologous recombination deficiency that those patients also benefit from the addition of a PARP to their maintenance strategy. As you mentioned, the clear unmet need still remains that patient population that has HRD tests negative. And we are getting incremental benefit with the addition. You can use a PARP inhibitor. Naraparib has an FDA approval there, but it's not as profound of a benefit as what we see with those patients that have some type of biomarker. So let's keep the focus, first of all, again, on the, let's say, BRCA patient. Uh, and Philip, I'm kind of curious, uh, again, putting aside, re I'm not sure what the reimbursement access issues are, but just purely in terms of the clinical science, how do you think through uh, which PARP inhibitor and for how long? I guess one of the issues in the wrapper was used for three years, a lapper for two years. It kind of looks like both, you know, you get a great benefit in the, in the uh, BRCA patients. How do you go about deciding which one and for how long? So I think for, for the BRCA mutant, it's completely free what your preference is. From the data, I cannot conclude clearly that one is better than the other one, and I think all of us have learned in the last years that you have a preference. This could be Olaparib or Neuraparib, and it's up to you what you prefer to use regarding the duration in the SOLO-1 trial. And it was two years in the, in the PRIMA trial. Uh, it was amended later. So the duration was not limited to three years. You mean you could go beyond that? Yes, oh, I didn't yes, know that. yes. We, we could. Um, I don't know the, the exact um, approval text in the US, but in Europe it's approved until progression. Huh, interesting. It's not limited to three years. But however, I think also we have to keep in mind that there are some risks regarding secondary neoplasms. And in my practice, I also stopped neuroparib after three years. And we put up here a slide just to remind people, particularly uh, those of you who are new to oncology, sort of the rapid evolution of this story over the last few years as these uh, trials came out. And we could spend a whole long time talking about it, but here's sort of a summary. Down there at the bottom, you see the Athena study, which seemed to kind of co uh, collaborate or corroborate what we'd already seen, but issues with the FDA and their data in the later line setting prevented from being approved. But it, at least the data that we saw look compatible. Uh, Dave, how do you approach a, a BRCA patient in terms of which PARP inhibitor, and particularly for how long? You know, we, we usually don't know the BRCA when we make the diagnosis. They come in uh, either neoadjuvant or, or primary surgery. And so we, we need to make the decision about what we're going to initiate in therapy before we have the BRCA results. So actually, Philip Harder did exploratory analysis on, on Apollo 1, and I quote you all the time, uh, a good friend of mine, and an amazing result, looking at high-risk versus low-risk patients. We used to define ascites, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, stage 4 disease as high risk, and that's really what we're excited about with BEV. <clears throat> Historically, we were looking for a subgroup of patients. Philip taught us that the low-risk patients, low-volume disease stage 3, actually benefited the most with BEV and Olaparib. That changed my practice in one paper. I know it's exploratory analysis, I probably took it too far, but it just, a light bulb went off. All of my patients get BEV. First line therapy, everybody gets BEV. Then I get the results back. I know they're BRCA or HRD, so if they're BRCA, I add Olaparib. And I continue Olaparib for two years per the trial and the risk of MDS. And if they're having some struggle with, a, with, with BEV, I feel very comfortable in a BRCA patient dropping the BEV, because I'm not sure how much incremental improvement the BEV plus the Olaparib have over Olaparib alone. So interesting algorithm. How long have you had that algorithm? Because I mean, we've been, I've, I've worked with you for years, and I think it's the first time I've heard that. It, it, it is a, it, the clarity has really come to me over the last year or so. And it really was just like, why are we making this so difficult? 
you know? And the benefits of the combination in low-risk patients who are HRD positive, including BRCA, is, I mean, I think the hazard ratio is like 0.1 or something. It was insane. And we, we need to use our best therapies on those patients who have the best chance of being cured. So Shannon, my, you know, I just sort of try to figure out what you all are doing and you know, hopefully facilitate people understanding that. Because up until now, I've been thinking, you have a patient with ascites, you want to use Bev early, a lot of disease, you're going to use Bev now, okay, PARP on top of it. But now he's bringing up this other issue with the low risk. Are you into this algorithm? Um, I don't know if I am as uh, <laughs> straightforward, <laughs> dramatically <laughs> emphatic about anything in life as David is. Um, no, I, you know, I definitely use a lot of bevacizumab. I, I, I haven't been using it um, for those patients that I take right to surgery. If I'm able to do an, uh, a cytoreduction reduction on a patient in the upfront setting, I often will treat with chemotherapy alone. Um, but that's also because of clinical trials that we have available right now and, and, uh, and other decision making that goes into it. So let's talk about the right side of this thing over here, particularly BRCA wild type HR proficient, because that's always been an area ever since the beginning of controversy. Uh, as Shannon mentioned, with the one agent you see uh, that we've had up to now, uh, Niraparib, we did see some benefit, I think, with the, uh, also with through Capra, but again, you know, 0.65, very similar, but not available. 0.68, certainly not what you see uh, with BRCA, but, also, but still, you know, significant. However, when you really look at what happens to these people, they do not have a good prognosis. Right. And so, you know, I guess that, that's certainly been an area of emphasis uh, in terms of what to do. Uh, just uh, we put in here just a little reminder of, I mean, if you all want to comment on it later on the long-term follow-up of these uh, really landmark trials that we're talking about uh, that have guided and here's uh, the Athena trial presented at ASCO. Uh, we'll get into this later, the issue. You know, we talked about a Lapra plus uh, Bev, but there are some data, only phase two at this point, of Nurapirib and Bev. Uh, Philip, what about the idea, and before we get into your study, of in the HR proficient patient, uh, the combination uh, there, again, if it's going to be a PARP inhibitor at this point, it's going to be niraparib. If you have a patient that you want to give PEV to for whatever reason, they've already been BEV, et cetera, do you think that niraparib plus BEV is a reasonable, theoretically a reasonable option to use at this point in HR proficient patient? Uh, I think at the end, unfortunately, we have no data what is better in the HR proficient population. So I think regarding the treatment algorithm, so at first you need a very good surgery. But unfortunately, and I think, I think one of the key points what we have learned from second line ovarian cancers that response on platinum is more predictive for the success of a PARP inhibitor therapy than any tests that we can use today. And, but if we have good surgery with complete resection, we could not evaluate um, if the patient is really platinum sensitive, if there's really a good response. And therefore, in this patient population, it is difficult. However, stage three with complete resection was also not included in the PRIMA trial. So we don't know really what is the effect in this patient population. But however, a um, certain number of patients um, <coughs> um, have neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And so for, for me, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so this is a population which is clearly at risk. For me, usually a recommendation to use bevacizumab. But however, we see some patients with really traumatic responses with very close to complete response after three cycles. I say, okay, now we have an in vitro testing That's interesting. of the activity of platinum, and then irrespective of the HID test result, I would say, okay, in this patient, we can also say, okay, first choice is a PARP inhibitor, and depending on the HID status, we could add bevacizumab. So, uh, Dave, can you kind of summarize where we are right now with these HR proficient uh, patients? You know, we see a hazard rate. I was mentioning to the faculty last night we were doing, our, maybe some of you were here for our prostate cancer program, and it's very interesting that there, they have a study, and actually the FDA approval came out like in the last couple of days uh, using PARP plus uh, 
uh, n a, a novel uh, anti-androgen uh, therapy, and they did. They also saw benefit in the BRCA patients. There is usually BRCA2, uh, but there the the PARP agent that they saw a benefit in was olaparib. They didn't see it with norepirib, but you know I don't know how much that has to do with the way studies were set up. But interestingly, the FDA just yesterday or the day before they they only approved it in PARP. They picked it out, where with you guys, they gave you the latitude to decide, and the prostate people are all upset that they're not going to have that opportunity right now. Well, 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 we know the FDA loves biomarkers, right? And that, that's been clear, and I understand. You, so let's, you said something very important, Neil, that we need to put into context, and that advanced stage ovarian cancer, BRCA patients, the most chemo-responsive patients, they're, they're long-term, they're, they're, they're cured, not recurred at five years, is at best 20%, maybe closer to 15. In HRD negative patient, it's probably closer to 10%. So 90% of our HRD test negative patients are going to recur. And they're usually gonna recur about 18 months. So we have to do better. So you asked me you know, kind of summarize where we're at. So, not that long ago, a hazard ratio of 35% improvement would have had us doing cartwheels in the hall. Now we're like, well, it's not a 70% improvement. It's not a 50%. But it's a modest improvement. I went back and looked at the Apollo 1 cross-trial comparison. You always give me grief for this, and you, very justifiably, right? So went back and looked at Apollo 1, the original presentation of HRD, BRCA, uh, HRD negative. At two years, only 20% of patients about had not recurred. And we're gonna get into the dual O data, but now it's 40%. Even though, again, modest, modest improvements in the hazard ratios, we are seeing improvements in HRD test negative, our greatest unmet need in ovarian cancer at this point. But I would argue that our greatest unmet need, Shannon and I talk about this all the time, curing more patients. And we have to change the discussion to, What's our best chance of curing more patients? I'm not sure if the triplet or what, you know, what is gonna be it, but I, I hope it is. I think it's just great with all the excitement, you know, that's been generated by these studies with PARP, and a lot of that's coming out of the BRCA patients. I mean, Solo One's an incredible study, but that's BRCA. There's a big difference between that and the numbers you just quoted. Well, let's just briefly, because we could spend the whole time just talking about the DUO study uh, that Philip just uh, presented <laughs> yesterday, We'll just kind of get to the top line. But first, I just want to ask you, Philip, uh, what's your vision about how theoretically you think an I.O. would be synergistic with a PARP inhibitor? So this is a very good question, and nobody could answer. <laughs> those are the, those <laughs> are the best <laughs> ones. So I think this was now the first trial um, combining bevacizumab, olaparib, and dovalumab, and we have seen all the other tumor entities, and sometimes the combination could increase the activity of the I.O. and we have to keep in mind that in the last years all the I.O. trials are in ovarian cancer, they were all negative. But now it's the first time that we have used a triplet. And maybe this is the secret behind the activity, but so far it's difficult to speculate what is really behind and I think it's an observation and we have multiple other ongoing trials also using an I.O. also using a PARP inhibitor, also using sometimes bevacizumab, and I think so we will see maybe the whole, um, the whole scenario and we will get a better picture of all the data um, in the next months. So yeah, this is really an evolving story, but I think the bottom line, the takeaway is that yesterday, as far as I know, was the first positive trial right. of immunotherapy of a checkpoint inhibitor ovarian cancer so at least from that point of view, it's certainly very noteworthy. A lot of debate's gonna go on about whether it's worth you know, trying to do this mm -hmm. strategy. It looks like there'd be a significant amount of expense there also as well. Um, more per, you can see down in the lower right, uh, the uh, maintenance uh, there was, uh, in the best arm was Bev, Dervin, or Laprib. Uh, as David was saying, uh, you know, the hazard rate wasn't that spectacular, but it definitely is positive. I think there's gonna be a lot of debate about whether or not to adapt this. You know, I think people are just sort of, they just saw the data yesterday trying to process it. Uh, uh, so, uh, Shannon, I'm curious about your initial thoughts. 
or are you thinking this is something you'd like to do outside of a trial? I mean, I'm definitely intrigued, and I think David said it. I mean, we are making progress, right? It, it, it's hard because there's, you know, we say we don't want to do cross-trial comparison, but the reason that we don't have that arm is because we already had those data from Paolo 1, and you can only do so large of a trial. This is thousands of patients already, and when you include all the, the, the three or four other studies that were done, we're talking about five to 6,000 patients on these upfront studies. Like, you have to be pragmatic. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is we always want to do everything we can to try to cure a patient, right? It's, it's what David was saying. If we have an opportunity to get a patient to a cure, then, then we're going to throw everything every resource we can at them. Um, I think what I was intrigued by was the adverse event profile was as expected, but it wasn't to me that much worse with the triple drug, drug combination, especially once you get into that maintenance phase. But it is an investment in time, and to your point, it's a financial investment. And so we do want to see more long-term data. I'm very hope I'm hopeful about overall survival because I think if we saw an overall survival benefit for that HRD test negative group, then I think that would seal the deal for us to feel really confident in utilizing it. And uh, David, you know, the question always comes up, what about anti-CTLA-4? Everybody always wants to know, has it been looked at? You know, Epinevo, Dervatremi, anything there in ovary? Well, there is. We had an NRG trial, and the KGOG has looked at it. You know, I think we always have to be um, cognizant of our, uh, our results from our Far Eastern colleagues. There, there is definitely a different patient population, a higher, chance, a higher occurrence of clear cell. And so immune therapy and combination immune therapy makes a lot more sense. I'm not sure if CTLA-4 and, and, and PD-1 or pd one inhibitors is really the answer, but we've seen some interesting results. The question is, you know, DUO is based on Mediola. Mediola was a platinum-sensitive treatment with the triplet, Bev, Derva, Olaparib. We had like an 88% response rate, a very small patient population, but that was in treatment. Why does it work? I, I, I'm not sure, but I mean, are we, gonna, are we gonna try to substitute one of those drugs for a CTLA-4? Is it really an opportunity in a platinum-resistant recurrent space? Probably the next generation of immune therapies is a much better chance to help us. But again, I'm looking for anything that could improve the outcomes of our patients. I like the idea of the bispecifics. That sounds really exciting. But we'll see whether that plays out. So let's start to bring in some of the questions we got from uh, oncologists. And one uh, kind of basic question, uh, Shannon, is where are we today in terms of your recommendations for how to test people? Mm -hmm. Somebody walks through the door with ovarian cancer, um, what you're thinking about the optimal way, uh, both in terms of timing, cost, efficiency, et cetera, somatic, germline, what stra strategy you recommend in the community? If, if you don't work at MD Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think we need all these data. We need all these information as soon as possible. So what, what we try to do is get the germline, the somatic, HRD testing, all at one time, especially from a financial standpoint, wherever you work, a lot of times if you keep ordering and you keep triggering genetic tests, you have run the risk of the payers saying, okay, you've already done it once and you do not want to push that cost back on the patient. And so we try to get all of those data that we know we're gonna need for that early care right away. So a few questions from oncologists, Philip. Uh, someone has a 40-year-old patient with stage 1C bracket 2 <laughs> positive ovarian cancer. The patient's very eager to use part maintenance, knowing she uh, has a BRCA mutation. Any data, any thoughts, Philip? Yes, I think this is a very good question. Unfortunately, so far we don't have any data about the use of a PARP inhibitor in early ovarian cancer, but however, we know also stage 1C um, this patient is at risk. If you do a long-term follow-up also for the early ovarian cancers, not 1A, but it starts with 1C, they have a relapse rate of about 30%. You know, in breast cancer, um, there's this idea that once you establish a hazard rate, you can bring it down, even look at even patients lower than that were looked at in the trial. So theoretically, could you apply that? I mean, what would you say the risk of relapse is uh, without a PARP inhibitor in that situation? Um, so if I have the option to use the PARP inhibitor upfront, I use it upfront. 
I think um, the activity of the PARP inhibitor correlates with the platinum sensitivity. But um, I mean, just the most platinum sensitive situation is in the front line. Right. So, you know, I think you, you, you must have missed my very wonderful GYN oncology reports that was just online the last couple of weeks about our early stage PARP inhibitors. So I say that ton in cheek because it was a, a case series uh, that we wrote, Monica Levine, one of our uh, fellows. You published uh, it? It, so GY College reports, we looked at our experience because this has come up, stage two, stage one C, incompletely staged, and I talk about this, incompletely staged stage one patients. And actually those patients who had BRCA who did get a PARP, we have no recurrences. So I think in a, in a population, if she was one C, with counseling, because her risk recurrence is at least 10%, but as high as 30%, in a 1C patient, um, that I, I do counsel them about options. Talk to them about MDS, talk to them about AML. Since there's not much data except for case series, um, we will talk to them about how long. Is it a year, is it two? We don't know, to, to, to Philip's point. But I do try to, to extrapolate data in a higher risk, low uh, stage patient. So yeah, we I mean, the, the issue of uh, patient involvement and decision making, something that gets stronger every day in oncology and medicine in general. So a uh, couple more questions from these oncologists. Uh, Shannon, PAL-B2, you approach that the same as BRCA. I've heard uh, Johan de Bono calls it PAL-B3. I mean, he calls it BRCA3. I, I definitely treat PAL-B2 just as I would BRCA. Is, and, and just to add to it, our RAD51C, RAD51D. And that's based on a couple of different series, including one from my colleague here, looking at who seemed to benefit the most from PARP inhibition. Um, and there's some great data, I think, in breast as well with PAL-B2 that they have really nice responses to, to PARP inhibitors. Um, so I, I, I do treat them the same. So, Philip, uh, here's a case uh, from the, an oncologist. Uh, a patient has been on PARP for three years, did not want to come off at two years, was one of lap rib, didn't want to come off, and went to three years, developed mild MDS, which I'm not sure what <laughs> mild MDS <laughs> is, but anyhow, uh, so the, the lap rib was stopped, and the patient started progressing, getting a platinum pro progressing. I, mean, I guess you can make the argument if they're progressing, maybe they wouldn't benefit by PARP anyhow. But uh, I guess the question is, would you come back to a PARP inhibitor in a patient like that, Philip, or just move on? Uh, I would not dare to do this. No. Yeah. So um, you have to keep in mind that the AML on, on the PARP inhibitors, you, usually those patients are difficult to trade, and most of them die within some weeks. And if you have a closer look at all your lab reports, then it's highly sus suspicious that there was also a mild MDS before, which was not diagnosed. So a couple more questions uh, from oncologists. Coming back to you, uh, David. Incidentally, we, uh, we were doing a program recently with interviewing Rich Stone from Dana-Farber, the AML MDS uh, expert. He made the analogy of MDS. So it's like uh, the bone marrow is like a factory where all the, drunk, all the uh, workers are drunk. <laughs> wow. I just like that analogy. Anyhow, uh, what do you say, uh, David, to your patients about the risk of AML and MDS? We know in the later line PARP trials, it looked like it was uh, higher, but you saw a high baseline rate without PARP as well. For practical purposes, particularly in this upfront setting, what do you say to your patients, David? I I'm very objective, like the risk of bowel perforation with BEV. We got to give them the information. They need to understand their information. We need to help them work through as the risk and benefit. So in AML, MDS, in the first line setting, I think we can say pretty confidently it's about one and a half percent, plus or minus a half percent. You could maybe argue one percent, plus or minus a half. In the upfront, if we stick to the two versus three years. Mm -hmm. In the recurrent setting, I just published what, uh, ex uh, what we call an extreme responders uh, from the aerial uh, data. Looking at the, those patients who, are, who were on PARP for more than two years, and, the and how the clinical features uh, compared to the short term. So to Shannon's point, RAD51C or D, but most importantly, beyond BRCA and RAD51C and D, was the clinical features Philip recommended. But what we found in this series 
was about a 10% MDS rate in those extreme responders. Mm. And in subpopulation as high as 15. So I went back, uh, Deb Armstrong Hopkins uh, wrote a, a, a pointed letter to the editor that I responded to. I love Deb, she's a good friend of mine. But it, we went through and listed out every MDS patient and the, the details. And I've started, I know there's no data, Philip and I were talking about this this morning. I've started limiting, limiting the length of PARP inhibitors in the platinum sensitive space because when we looked at that group, 10% and M low grade MDS, I mean, I think Philip, you just said this, they die, if they get, di if they get diagnosed with MDS and they have uh, ovarian cancer, they die and they die quickly. So I talked to my patients about it may be as high as 10% in the platinum sensitive space, which gives me more confidence and maybe ammunition to utilize PARP in the first line setting before they're heavily pretreated carboplatin. So one to, to, one to two percent in the first line setting, at least at least four to eight percent in the platinum sen sensitive setting, and if they are on treatment for longer, it could even go above 10 percent. And I lay those numbers out very objectively. So uh, let's talk about some other practical questions that were brought up by the oncologist. One that was very common, Shannon, was uh, now that we're uncovering all these people with germline mutations, what do you do about the breasts? Uh, do you ever do prophylactic mastectomies in a patient with ovarian cancer? Uh, how do you approach screening? Any, uh, what, are your, what are your practices, Shannon? Yeah, so you definitely want to get them involved with someone that does high-risk uh, breast screening. And we, you know, we get them involved usually after they finish their chemotherapy. They'll meet with those experts, and they will start on every six-month screening. And we do utilize prophylactic mastectomy, but generally what we've done is wait about two years from the completion of their ovarian cancer therapy. And what's nice about that now is those patients are receiving a PARP inhibitor. So essentially, once they complete their PARP inhibitor therapy, then they're kind of teed up and ready to go to have the prophylactic mastectomy if that's what they've chosen to do. David? You know, I've really struggled with this at, at, at our institution, and I'm curious you know, we've had to educate our surgical oncologists because our patients go in to see them. They go, you have ovarian cancer. You're going to be dead in a few years. Go, no, no, no. The chance that a BRCA patient with advanced ovarian cancer is, and I'm going to say this word again, cured, is about 45 47% with PARP inhibitors. So if they make, especially if they make it two years. So I've had to educate our surgical oncology colleagues that the death sentence when they trained is no longer there. And so we do need to have our patients consider prophylactic surgery, more aggressive screening for their breast cancer once they complete therapy. So I'm glad to hear that you're having good luck with that. Incidentally, one of the, another very common, I was not surprised, but a very noted because I was wondering about this. Another very common uh, point made in these uh, questionnaires was a lot of people talking about lack of access to genetic counseling out in the community. And I was curious, uh, uh, and F Philip, I'm curious uh, what your experience is with uh, telemedicine. You know, when we started, when the pandemic came in, one of the first things I was thinking is, gen I always thought genetic counseling, or at least ought to have the option of telemedicine, but there, there are a lot of docs who do not seem to have access to genetic counselors. Any thoughts? Uh, Philip, and uh, do you have any of the services available uh, uh, virtually? Um, yes, yeah, so far we have only limited experience with telemedicine, but I think at least in my country we have not so big distances between the genetic right. between options We're centralized. for genetic counseling, and if the patients are in our hospital for primary surgery, we counsel them by ourselves. So they don't need to go to another institution for for the genetic testing. David, uh, any, anything in terms of what's going on in the U.S. and from that? Well, you know, I think we, we, we have uh, unbelievable resources at The Ohio State University, and I actually have a, a genetic counselor embedded in my clinic uh, most days of the week. And so we've really worked with our community physicians with telehealth um, and having access. But, you know, I would challenge uh, our, our oncology community that Remember the consent form when patients first started treating for HIV? Mm. And we went to this long, extensive c consent form. Now what I say is, hey, we're going to test you for HIV, right? 
we're getting to that point in genetics, and, and, and I know I'm probably gonna anger a few people by saying this, but to say at this point, we would recommend genetic testing and semantic testing, and then if there's a result that's positive, utilize our genetic counselors. And again, each state has different rules, each, everybody's, but, but there's no reason we can't have a separate appointment or our APPs have a separate appointment to talk to them about the genetics, bring them back and then discuss the results just as a, an additional visit where the, the, there's limited resources. Then if there's a problem, there's many resources for telehealth in the United States through the genetic testing companies, as well as larger institutions, we have overcome these barriers with the remote. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about uh, recurrent ovarian cancer. We'll talk about some new approaches, uh, but also the issue of PARP inhibitors in the relapse setting. So first, uh, Shannon, any comments on the issue of PARP after PARP? particularly patients that get primary maintenance, have it stopped, and then relapse later on. Yeah, I mean, the and bottom line... one trial, for example. Yeah, the Areo trial was a, was a nice proof of concept study that looked at this idea of PARP after PARP. The, the trouble with this study is, is that this was a very unique PARP after PARP combination and that the majority of these people had received three and four lines of platinum. So an uber platinum responsive group, to Philip's point about what predicts benefit from PARP. It's not a super common group of patients that we're gonna see in our practice and didn't really, and that's not their fault, but didn't really include the population that got primary maintenance um, and then followed that up with PARP. So that's the first thing. This, the second thing is, is that we know that this idea of recurrence after PARP is going to be very dependent. We, we think it's going to be very dependent on when it happens, right? Did the tumor start to grow when the patient was still on the PARP inhibitor maintenance versus we stopped the PARP inhibitor and then the cancer came back? So that's a different group of patients. And so I think I'm very intrigued about the idea of PARP in that group where you stopped it. I'm, I'm still interested, but not as sure about the group that has tumor grow on the PARP inhibitor. But regardless, the Areo study did show a benefit with PARP after PARP, but it was modest. So yeah, you have the analogy in breast cancer, HER2, they keep the HER2 therapy going, mm -hmm. change stuff in between, David? So, uh, you know, th that is such an important point. PARP exposed versus true PARP resistant progression while on PARP. Isabel Ray Cucard is presenting the Powell One data on that exact scenario in the poster session tomorrow, which is embargoed until tomorrow, though I saw it yesterday when I sit next to her. But I'm not <laughs> going to say anything. I'm really looking forward to seeing that data at the poster session tomorrow. So, uh, Philip, any uh, thoughts? Uh, would you use a PARP inhibitor in somebody who progressed in one previously? Um, yes, we participated also in the OREO trial, and we included also some patients. and. It was really impressive to see that most patients um, progressed within three months. Mm -hmm. However, I have one patient, she was on PARP inhibitor maintenance for the second relapse um, for three years. She relapsed and we gave her again platinum-based chemotherapy and she had a complete remission. And then she was included in the oral trial. At the end of the trial, she was on blinded. She received the PARP inhibitor, and now she's still on the PARP inhibitor for a second time for more than four years, and she's still fine. So, uh, if somebody did not, just to finish, I'm sorry. For right, okay. If somebody did not progress on the PARP and it stopped because they completed their therapy, I have zero concern about restarting. If they progress, that's a different story outside of a clinical trial. With the MDS risk that we talked about earlier, and very, very important discussion with that. So uh, this has always been a challenge for me to understand. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Weston oh, thanks. <laughs> give us a two-minute explanation of what's going on with the FDA, all these late line, where we are today right now. I guess uh, the bottom line is in what situations, if any, would you use a PARP inhibitor in the recurrent setting now today? Now today. I would use a PARP inhibitor in the recurrent setting in two very specific situations. One is on clinical trial, where we're doing it, we're looking at different combination strategies and things like that. Two is those patients that were on a PARP inhibitor in the recurrent setting at the time of the withdrawals. So they were getting a benefit, they were already being treated, 
those patients I'm having a serious discussion with about the data and allowing them to make the decision if they want to come on or off. What is your take about the data? Like, what's, what is this all about? You know, there's clearly something there, right? I mean, there's consistent data across the different PARP inhibitors that there's this potential survival detriment. However, when you look at these data, it's in patients that we've just been talking about we wouldn't expect benefit, right? So the platinum resistant group, right? And you and I have talked about this, where if we don't do a good job of using either our, biomar our molecular biomarkers or our clinical biomarkers to select patients, then we pay the price, right? So some of the studies, for example, the Ariel study, um, Ariel 4, the, there was a survival benefit, and all of this is non-analytic endpoints, right? We didn't put statistical power towards this, so we just have to be careful. But when you tease out the, the platinum-sensitive group, they seemed to still have, a, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a survival detriment. But if you looked at that group with platinum resistance, that's where the survival detriment was. Nova data. As we got more and more data, as we got more and more information, you saw less and less of a, of a potential survival detriment. But it was enough, I'd say, in the eyes of the FDA to say, well, we might be hurting people, right? I mean... Well, could I just clarify one thing and then just get your other take on that? So in other words, if you have a patient who is platinum-sensitive recurrent disease, you don't follow that up with a PARP inhibitor? No, maintenance is different. So treatment is one thing. Yeah. Platinum-sensitive maintenance in a patient that either that has a biomarker, right, that patient I'm going to treat with a PARP inhibitor. But in the recurrent setting. In the recurrent setting as a maintenance strategy after platinum. And then and one of the oncologists asked the question, of which PARP inhibitor? So right now, if they have a mutation, you have the array of, of PARP inhibitors that you can use, right? You can use Olaparib, Rucaparib, or Niraparib. If they do not have a mutation based on label, the only PARP inhibitor you can consider is Olaparib. So uh, let's uh, move on. I want to hear what you have to say about antibody drug conjugates. We're hearing um, about antibody drug conjugates in lots of different tumors, uh, now part of uh, first-line therapy of uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. It was first line, part of the first-line therapy for Hodgkin. We'll see whether that's going to change in the next uh, couple days. And of course, bladder cancer, many other cancers, breast cancer, et cetera. Uh, David, uh, someone has a 67-year-old patient, stage 4 uh, ovarian cancer, carbo, paclitaxel, followed by BEV maintenance. This is a patient, uh, sounds like, who's uh, BRCA negative, uh, progressed uh, after chemo, got carbo, paclitaxel again, and now ready for something else. How do you think through therapy at this point, uh, David? Uh, in a patient like this? So she, she's, she's secondary platinum refractory. She's progressed uh, after being platinum sensitive, you know, um, uh, barely platinum sensitive, cause especially because she's on BEB. So, so she is secondary platinum refractory resistant, right? So we go to our typicals, bagley liposome and doxorubicin, weekly paclitaxel, uh, um, uh, tobotecan, you know, I use cytoxin BEV. Number one is clinical trial. But now, now, what, what we're trying to do is we talked about testing before. We didn't talk about testing for folate receptor alpha. Soon, hopefully, nappy 2 b How about HER2 new with some of these ADCs? So when we send off our next generation sequencing, we're going to send off a series of IHCs at the same time. And at diagnosis, I'm going to know if they're folate receptor alpha high. And in that patient population, in this scenario, if I knew she's high folate receptor alpha, I'd actually probably go right to MERV, particularly because she just progressed on carbotaxel. Now, why do I say carbotaxel? Because I'm not going to go to weekly taxel, which is probably one of our best regimens, or the best regimen, 30% response rate. We, we're, we're literally being presented right now is the Marisol data, where we saw the press release at a 42% response rate with MERV in the platinum resistant space. So if she's high folate receptor alpha testing, most likely she's going to get MERV with a 42% response rate. And uh, Philip, can you talk a little bit about sort of what MERV is? Again, it's an antibody drug conjugate. What we know about efficacy, again, as David said, we're going to see some more data. We are seeing it right now. And particularly the issue of tolerability and the ophthalmic issues with MERV and what you've seen, Philip. Yeah, so I think we had a, a learning curve, how to handle the toxicity and 
So this eye toxicity was a completely new side effect of a drug. We have never experienced such a side effect as gynecologists before. However, we have now learned, so with eye drops, with steroids, and also with a cool cap, so it's manageable. And to my experiences, even if there are some um, eye problems, so if you just reduce the dose and from six to five milligrams, so it's tolerated by most patients. And maybe you just wait um, before you give the next cycle one week longer, and then it's fine. So regarding this eye toxicity, I was very concerned in the beginning. But now, um, as we use this more and more, I um, say it's absolutely feasible. Um, but however, there are some patients with really severe eye toxicity. And I will never forget one of my patients. She told me, um, because I wanted to stop mirvatuximab, and she told me, oh, it's better to be blind than dead. Wow. So, yeah, and we've, you know, of course, eye toxicity is something you're seeing. And you know, we did a whole program with an ophthalmologist on ophthalmic issues in oncology, particularly these antibody drug conjugates, but even uh, beyond then. Here, it's interesting, we had a number of docs say they had patients who were, were concerned, didn't want to get MERV because of, you know, they, they get kind of freaked out about that. Uh, one more uh, thing about MERV, I'm curious, uh, Shannon, we have a patient, uh, uh, treated with MERV who got grade one pneumonitis. Has that been reported? Uh, apparently they tried to, they weren't sure if it was pneumonitis or tumor, but they thought it was uh, pneumonitis. Uh, have you seen this? Has this been reported with MERV? Uh, would you restart it? Yeah, I mean, there's rare pneumonitis, and, and uh, it, it's not something that you would expect or generally see very commonly. Um, I would definitely restart. You know, one of the things that our pulmonary team will do is give a short course of steroids and see if that improves that the, 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 uh, the issue in the lung. If it does, then you can feel a, a little bit more confident that it was drug-related, and then potentially restart um, as long as it resolves. So interesting here, too, a comment about, again, it's interesting how, you know, we're always talking with people in tertiary centers. You get people are out in the rural uh, areas. They may not have access to an op ophthalmologist asking whether or not an optometrist is okay to do this check. Uh, Dave, I'm curious whether you've used optometrists. Also, the other question, how quickly can you see a response of a patient's highly symptomatic? Uh, can you get a quick response out of MERV? So let me start with that part. Absolutely. Most of our responses to the first or second disease assessment, you know, the NCCN guidelines did list MERBEV based on our work in Forward 2 that I've been honored to lead. So if you need that extra boost, um, you can add BEV to it. So going back to the eye question, so it was really interesting. A clinical trial was really easy. We had our ophthalmologist. They, were, they have appointments for the, for the clinical trial patients. They got right in. They're all at OSU. It was great. And then, they, then it became commercially available, and I said, well, we'll just put them out. They're like, well, we don't have appointments, right? And then my patients would say, why can't I just go to the optometrist that's down the street? And so I have to give Imogen a lot of credit here. They actually put together a beautiful form that says, what are you looking for? What do you need and how to grade it and any recommendations? We literally, because we're not allowed to do anything with, with the Imogen label on it, reproduced that, took off the Imogen label, and my nurse practitioner hands it to the patient and says, take this to your optometrist and let us know. Mm -hmm. And it's worked great. I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable. Here's exactly what you need to know. We give them a copy of them, they take in each appointment. So, you know, I think as we look at this and we identify what I prefer as somebody who's familiar with ADCs and the eye toxicity, sure, but that's if they have problems. Now, if they have pop problems, then I'm gonna get them into my specialty uh, uh, ophthalmology area to help me manage those. But for a screening, absolutely. So Philip, again, I'm kind of curious, you, know, you can look at a paper and then, but I also like to ask people in terms of the quality of responses that you see with MERV. We were talking before in the, uh, in the faculty room about like sasituzumab. And you, know, it's, you look at the paper, you see the number, but then you start asking oncologists, you know, what's your experience with it in breast cancer? You know, I see a bunch of people nodding and they got, yeah, these people respond. Any, can you give us more of a feel for, you know, what kind of benefit you see with the uh, Mervituximab? I think it's, this drug works. It's really, and it's the first ADC that we have approved, and I'm really jealous, it's approved in the US and not in Europe. <laughs> so, <laughs> therefore we only have access to this drug. 
within clinical trial, but it's really impressive. Um, but um, if you have such a symptomatic patients as you just described, you always have to keep in mind that you need some additional days for testing for large receptor alpha if you have not done this before. And if you have, for example, another alternative like PLD or paclitaxel weekly, I would start with this drug, do testing in parallel, and you also have to keep in mind that um, the rate of follicular alpha positivity is between 30 and 40 percent. So it's not the majority. So in a symptomatic patient, if I have an alternative, I would start with another drug before and then check if this might be an option for later then. So uh, we're doing a program on bladder cancer in this room Monday morning, and there they have two antibody drug conjugates approved, sasituzumab, but also enfortimab. And Fortimab just got bumped up to first line with Pembro uh, as an option for people not eligible for platin. Uh, but we now also have another antibody drug conjugate, Upri, uh, David, uh, and a lot of interest. I've been clicking up these uh, graphics for a level of interest and in, like the red. The more red you see, the more people want to know about it. And they definitely want to know more about uh, Upri. Uh, David, I know you've had a lot of experience with it. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what this is, what NAP12B, actually NAP2B is, how this works, what we know about efficacy and tolerability? Right. NAP2B is also differentially expressed on ovarian cancer cells or cancer cells, which we know is, is a hallmark for antibody drug conjugates. So we don't see a lot of abnormality, we don't see a, a bit, but what we do see is this expression rate is, is quite high, probably greater than Two, or about two-thirds or even higher patients. Um, it also is antimicrotubulin with active payload. So though it's an antimicrotubulin, people say, well, you know, MERV's already in the market. MERV's in the market for high folate receptor alpha, mm -hmm. not nappy 2 b And so we'll see a poster here by Deb Richardson looking at our, using RNA rather than IHC, and there's not that much overlap uh, between them. Uh, when we're looking at nappy 2 b and folate receptors. So in the future, I'll test both of those. And if they're in that percentage of patients that have both, I'll have to make the decision. But you see here, this is the, the efficacy data. S similar to MERV, most patients are getting disease regression. Okay, so when we talk about objective response rates, we're talking about those that hit the 30% threshold and then have a repeat CAT scan showing it confirmed, because we only report the confirmed partial responses. But we don't talk about how many patients have disease regression. To Philip's point earlier, most patients with MERV get disease regression, and you're seeing the majority here with UPRI. What, uh, any difference in terms of levels of NAPI2B in terms of response, uh, David? And what do you see in terms of tolerability? I know you were telling me, you know, a lot of these antibody drugs, you know, for example, TDXD, you see chemo side effects. I mean, they use pre preemptive medication, et cetera. And I know there was a dose adjustment made uh, with UPRI. Bottom line is, is there a difference based on NAPI2B level? And what do you see tolerability-wise? Yeah, efficacy, they're figuring out, they're using a TPS scoring and they're using greater than 25%, which seems to differentiate the scoring. The highest may have a higher response and we'll have to differentiate that. So there is a biomarker and it's gonna be a TPS and it's gonna be greater than 25%. So with regards to the side effect profile, you don't have the ocular toxicities that you see in MERV, but you do have other toxicities, GI, fatigue, fever. So, um, from the 42 that we were dosed at down to 36, it's much better tolerated at 36. The prospective trial that's being performed is in the platinum sensitive maintenance. And they've actually dropped the dose down to 30 in that maintenance setting because of those concerns. We have a mitigation strategy to make sure they have antiemetics, make sure they have control of their diarrhea, uh, mm. Tylenol uh, for fever, and we'll even set people up for IV fluids if, to get them through those first couple of cycles. Once we have that dose figured out, because the majority of patients will require dose reduction like many of our drugs, once we figure out that dose, then we don't need to use those mitigation strategies. Do you visualize these side effects as sort of chemo-like? Do you think Absolutely. this is chemo? Because that's what you hear like with TDXD. They say, well, this is chemo, but it's targeted chemo, but you're gonna get chemo. It, 
Absolutely. This is chemo, a smarter, personalized approach, a targeted therapy, but it is a form of chemo. So, uh, Shannon, of course, everybody wants to know where do you see this fitting in? We need to see a little, some more data here, but assuming things go along this, uh, this track, where do you see UPRI landing? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first opportunity that we're going to have to use it is going to be in the platinum resistant setting because um, that's where we're going to get our first indication. I think to be determined if we're going to need to do that nappy 2B testing or if it's going to be that we see activity in all comers and that we'll be strategizing between the patients that have the folate receptor alpha test positive versus not. Once we get there, though, of course, we're very excited and hopeful that we will be able to move it earlier on, move it into that potential maintenance setting if the um, uplift, up next, <laughs> up next study is positive. <laughs> so, uh, Philip, again, any thoughts about UPRI and where you see it landing? Is it something you uh, think is going to work its way into practice? Yes, I think it's a very interesting drug, and I think we discussed already the um, resistance to PARP inhibitors thereafter. And resistance to PARP inhibitors is also correlates with platinum resistance. And we are now using already PARP inhibitor in frontline. And traditionally, we learned if the relapse is more than six months after platinum, we will reuse platinum again. But what we have seen already in other publications, so that the activity of platinum after PARP inhibitor is limited. So therefore, I don't know maybe in the future if we need platinum-free alternatives and maybe um, APRI is here an opportunity in this space. So tumor treating fields in ovarian cancer, we actually presented a couple of patients treated on the trial with paclitaxel at a symposium we did at the uh, SGO meeting. A lot of interest in oncologists, and I imagine a lot more interest after Tuesday for those of you who weren't here Friday night when we did our lung cancer session, there's an embargoed phase three trial of tumor treating fields, uh, second line therapy of non-small cell lung cancer, a positive trial. Nobody knows the hazard rate. The lung people are just holding their breath to see what happens, you know, either skeptics or the optimists. But I'm gonna be ready Tuesday at 7 a.m. to read that uh, abstract and see what's going on. Uh, but uh, David, you, you know, it's hard to find people who've even had experience with tumor treating fields. Again, we found a couple of oncologists that have been on trials. You've uh, participated in that. First of all, what's the bottom line of what these patients uh, kind of go through? Uh, people bring up the inconvenience of you know, wearing the vest, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about tumor treating fields, how your vision of how it works, and how it plays out in practice. So, so I was talking to Dr. Vergot uh, at uh, ASCO, I think about five years ago, and, and uh, had seen this, the, some of this data, and I, I approached the Novacare people about tumor treating fields to move this trial into the U.S., and then I'm the U.S. lead for this, so it's antimicrotubulin. And when I first brought it up, I kind of said, this stuff's crazy, right? But they just keep producing positive results in really resistant disease, glioblastoma, uh, a mesothel thoracic mesothelioma, single arm trial, but now a phase three overall survival in non-small cell lung. I can't wait to see the data. We have a pancreatic uh, a, a trial that's ongoing and we should report the ovarian cancer, I hope this year. And they've said that publicly. So in antimicrotubulin, you have these arrays that you should wear for 18 hours and they have a backpack. Um, we saw a little bit more dermatologic toxicity than we were anticipating. As you can imagine, holding a raise, you have allergic reaction, you have some searing, you know, just movement. Much different than this, putting that on the scalp that doesn't have much movement, right? So in the abdominal cavity, so they actually updated the uh, array. They made the backpack smaller at the expense of a little bit of the battery life, but made it a little bit more convenient. But the arrays are much more... Um, uh, flexible would probably be the word. And so when we look at this, we're hoping, I don't have as much experience because they, they instituted the new array right at the end of the trial, okay? But it seems to, when I talk to patients, they're tolerating a little bit better, with a little bit less dermatologic toxicity. Yeah, that's what we heard about with these two patients. Shannon, any uh, thoughts about this? We actually uh, brought in uh, one of your neuro-oncologists. I don't know if you know Shirag Patel. Of course, yeah. But I had read all these papers. He wrote these 
long papers of translation of how it works and all. We brought them on a webinar just to try to explain why it worked and kind of started to make sense to me. Of course, the bottom line is, you know, the clinical outcome. Any thoughts about uh, how this is going to play out if we do see positive results in terms of patient acceptance? Again, so the lung people are all freaked out about it. And I'm like, you know, a dose of Taxil is not a walk in the park either. And that's, right. you know, so anyhow, any thoughts, Shannon? Yeah, I mean, I think the phase two data were very intriguing, which is what led to D Dr. O'Malley's phase three. We're eagerly anticipating the results, and it's certainly a well-defined study, so it should give us a clear answer. I think as far as where it will go in practice, I mean, you're looking here at the adverse events, it looks very tolerable, you know, a lot of grade one, two, not very many grade three, and that's really important in a platinum-resistant population. Um, and we'll have to figure out again how we sequence it with MERV with maybe the UPRI and other, you know, and how does it compare to, say, weekly paclitaxel and bevacizumab? So I think all of those things will need to be considered. But if it's a positive trial, we're going to be excited about it. Especially overall survival. I mean, it's, it's straight overall survival. There's no PFS as right. a primary endpoint, only OVS. Can't, can't argue with overall survival. That's why I want to see what that lung study says, but I'm the eternal optimist. <laughs> Anyhow, Philip, any final comments about tumor treating fields? How do you think that's going to play out if positive? Yes, I'm, um, I think this is absolutely a completely new option. It's not a chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. We just have to wear kind of a jacket for 18 hours per day. And since the battery was really big in the beginning, now it's much smaller, and I think it's really be tolerable. And if you compare this to the side effects of weekly paclitaxel, I think it's much better, and this would be preferred by most patients. Well, there's always patient-reported outcomes, and I'm so happy that we're looking at that more and more now. I ask the patient what they think. I want to thank the faculty for coming here this morning. Thank you. Coming back this evening, 7 p.m., we're going to talk about CLL, lymphomas, and multiple myeloma. Have a great day.